so I've actually got an eye beacon attached to my cat. Ruby is alive, Ruby's not going in. Oh, I want to dream for developer happiness. Hackers are everywhere. People like this guy, sitting in his laptop in that balaclava, destroying your user accounts. People like this woman who apparently got hold of a laptop in jail. People like this guy who needs sunglasses to hack and get into people's accounts uh, because it's, he's just too damn bright. And you can see it's working because there is money literally pouring out of the keyboard. Hi, I'm Phil. Uh, I'm a developer evangelist for Twilio. Um, uh, Twilio, if you don't know, is a um, communications platform. Uh, it's an API to connect the people you care about using the tools, languages, and frameworks that you already know. Uh, I'm not here to talk about Twilio, of course, but things around that, things that we've, we, we have dealt with and seen a lot of usage for. Um, that is me uh, online everywhere. It's pretty much Phil Nash uh, everywhere, uh, except for Last FM. Um, because they don't let you change your usernames, and I'm stuck with what 19-year-old Phil thought was a great idea for a username. Uh, and you can ask me about that in the pub afterwards. <laughs> so, 2FA, WTF, what am, what am I talking about? Um, as, as, um, as we said, it's, it's two-factor authentication. Um, so who here uh, knows what two-factor authentication is? Right, we've got a, pretty much everyone, right? And, and you know, who has two-factor authentication set up on their important accounts, like Gmail and, and Twitter and anything like that? Dropbox, yeah. Uh, anybody who put their hand down in that time or didn't re-raise their hand or whatever should probably go right now. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying, like, you offended me or anything. I mean, you should go and set that up. That's important and more important than what I'm about to say. Like, look after yourself first. Um, so just as a, as a definition, definition um, I'm going to read this out if you don't mind. Two-factor authentication is a security process in which a user provides two different forms of identification in order to authenticate themselves with a system. Uh, the two forms must come from different categories, uh, normally something you know and something you have. Uh, the third option on that uh, is maybe something that you are, kind of a biometrics thing, um, although that's uh, arguably... Um, uh, it, that's arguable as to whether it's any use or not. I've seen a couple of very good articles recently about how fingerprints are just basically a bad password that you can't uh, change. Um, so worth considering. Um, so we're talking about something you know uh, and something you own. Uh, the excellent example of this, of course, is, um, is something like a bank account, uh, where you know your PIN number and you own the uh, bank card in which to make, with which to make payments. And then we go online with this kind of thing. So why am I talking about this? Um, we all know kind of what use, um, what uh, or two-factor two authentication is, um, but uh, I want to I just go into why it's a good idea and why we need to uh, think about this for ourselves as developers. Um, so I want to introduce you to Matt Honan. He was a, he's a journalist, uh, and back in 2012, his digital uh, identity, his digital life, uh, was effectively erased. Uh, and I want to take you through how that happened uh, as just an example of what can go horribly, horribly wrong. Um, so this is kind of a, a timeline of the events uh, that, that led to a whole bunch of horrible things happening to Matt. Uh, the attackers found his Gmail address on his personal site. Perfectly reasonable. Um, they entered that address in Gmail and found he had a backup email address uh, at uh, me.com, uh, which he didn't really use. But that was his backup. You know, If he forgot his Gmail account password, it could be sent to his me.com uh, Apple-based account. Uh, the attackers called up Amazon uh, to add a credit card to his uh, user account in Amazon. Uh, they did this. Um, uh, and all you need to do with that is provide a couple of bits of information, uh, a name and a billing address. Uh, so like, billing address might be hard to find. I don't, I don't know. Like, can anybody think of, of a good way you might find someone's billing address online? If, who, who is, exactly? Who is, has your billing address? They already knew his personal site. Um, that's about the most technical part of this hack. Um, so, they had, so they added a credit card, any credit card, it didn't really matter, to this guy's Amazon file. Once they'd done that, they put the phone down, picked it straight back up again, and said, hey, Amazon, I've forgotten my password. 
Uh, they tried to go through security questions, and uh, ev hey, they couldn't answer that. So eventually, they asked for three bits of information: name, address, and uh, sorry, billing address, and the last four digits of a credit card that's on file. So they knew that, uh, and they were able to um, change the email on the account and reset the password to that to their email. Lovely. So they're in Amazon. Not particularly useful for destroying somebody's life. Kind of useful if you want to uh, order up um, uh, anything to arrive the next day. However, at 4.33, and this is kind of where the, the timeline comes in as, as what the investigation found what happened to this, um, the attackers called up Apple to reset their, his password on, on his me.com me account. Again, they went through security questions which they couldn't answer, and eventually they asked for those same three bits of information. Uh, a, 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 the name, billing address, and last four digits of a credit card on file. Now, of course, this time they're not using the fake ones, because in the Amazon account, it shows you the last four digits of your credit cards. So they were able to reset the me.com password uh, and gain access to his email. Following on from that, at 4.52, they reset the Gmail account password back to me.com. Uh, 5.01, uh, using the Apple uh, Find, My, Find My Phone, uh, wiped his iPhone. This is when he started to get suspicious. <laughs> At 5.02, they reset his Twitter password. At 5.05, they also remotely wiped his MacBook and deleted his entire Google account. Uh, and then at 5.12, uh, posted to his Twitter account uh, to take credit for the hack. Um, you know the reason why they went through all these steps? Um, in order to just break this guy's life down? Because, because what? It's because his Twitter Twitter handle was incredibly short, yeah. Um, Three-letter Twitter handle. And they were like, ooh, I'm not having that. They didn't want the thing. They wanted to post um, racist and homophobic remarks to it, uh, oddly enough. And they didn't use his Amazon account or his credit cards to go and pay things. They just wanted to do that. Of course, in the, in the, in the process of this, uh, wiping his Gmail uh, account, his, um, his iPhone, his MacBook, he lost a bunch of photos that weren't up, up uh, that weren't backed up, uh, which arguably is somewhat his fault, but all the same, not cool. But at any one of those stages, uh, if at any time during that process they'd have had to uh, reach to a second factor, then they'd have been lost. All they were doing, all they were dealing with was a single factor, a single bit of knowledge, or a few bits of knowledge, but effectively a same category of things. And so, uh, it was very easy for them to break through uh, all the walls of, uh, uh, of customer support uh, and return uh, and, and get into all those accounts. Now, I think some of uh, like the Apple and Amazon holes have kind of been patched. I don't know uh, how they deal with things these days, uh, but uh, you, you can't use this technique anymore. This was kind of famous. This was back in 2012. So that's you know why you should put two-factor authentication on yours. Thing, but we're still developers, so um, and and you're probably using something like one password or last pass to maybe make strong passwords that are unguessable and uncrackable and things like that, uh, right? Uh, I'm not actually, uh, I'm bad at this, but we'll move on from that. Um, I want to talk about another hack uh, that happened recently, um, the the Ashley Madison hack, uh, I, and I'm I, I wish to pass no judgment on members of Ashley Madison, uh, but they were in trouble when all the data came out. Uh, but the worst part of it was that um, uh, was what was discovered about these accounts. Uh, and so um, a security firm took the kind of data from the hack and managed to decrypt 11 million of the, of the passwords, um, which is bad. Some sites are pretty bad at looking after passwords. We know how to do it. But th they'd got it wrong for at least 11 million of them. And so they got, the, uh, um, they got this whole list of passwords. And I'd like to present to you the uh, Ashley Madison top 10 uh, countdown password list because it's horrifying. One, two, three, four, five, six. In at number one. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Closely behind and just a little lazier is one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> um, you might have guessed it was at the top, but password in all lower cases there at number three, and not even password one. Um, default <laughs> seems sensible. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. For those who could make it all the way to the end of the keyboard, uh, QWERTY for those that couldn't. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. For those who got really close, um, ABC one, two, three for the uh, imaginative ones. Um, number nine is not NSFW. Uh, number nine was not safe for work, so I'm not reading it out on stage. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and number 10 was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. <laughs> Just wonderful. And these are the numbers of those times those passwords were used. 120,000 people use 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on a site that quite literally has a woman saying, shh, this is secret. <laughs> Sites are bad with passwords, and users are terrible with passwords. So we somewhat owe it to them uh, to, uh, to, to protect them more, I think, anyway. And the source of, of that is all there. Uh, and finally, I, I just a point from something I think, I, I guess, uh, many people will possibly use, uh, Slack. Uh, when they got hacked earlier this year in, in March, um, they announced the hacking, they announced the incident, and turned on two-factor authentication at the same time. So I feel like, uh, you know, if, if, if large people like that are doing this, then there is definitely a need for this. Uh, and if you have something, any kind of site, and I know a lot of people had hands up earlier with my app has a user model in, um, then uh, you have something that users are looking after, something that you think is worth buying putting a pass something you think is worth putting behind a password, it's probably worth putting behind uh, a second factor authentication as well. Good. Oops. So how do we go about it? Not from jail with a laptop that you found. If we look at the normal user registration flow, it's fairly simple, right? You go to your registration page on site, uh, you sign up with the username and password, and the user's logged in. Lovely. Uh, maybe you do an email verification, and then the user's logged in, but that's what we do. And then logging in, you look, visit the login page, you enter that username and password, uh, the system verifies that they are correct, and the user is then logged in. Perfectly reasonable. Yeah? So there are a bunch of ways of doing two-factor authentication, uh, which affect this flow, of course. Uh, the first one uh, is, is using uh, SMS. Um, we do this at Twilio. I don't know mention it. Um, uh, using SMS, it's a um, fairly similar uh, registration flow. You need to um, sign up with a username, password, and a phone number, of course. Uh, this allows the site to then, in uh, login, uh, visit the login page, uh, go through the verification of username and password, and then, uh, once those are fine, uh, send off a code uh, to the user via SMS. It's usually a six-digit code. That seems to be the kind of thing people have settled on. Uh, it can, in this particular case, just be random six digits, and you just save that to the user account, although there are better ways of doing that. And then the user enters that verification code, and you can, and, and you can verify that against the code you expected to see. User's logged in. Brilliant. So there are some pros and cons to this kind of method. Um, the pro is very much that uh, most people in the world have, uh, have a device that can receive SMS text messages. That seems fairly reasonable. It is a low barrier to entry. Um, more and more people in uh, developing countries uh, are getting, on, getting even online, uh, but they were having uh, other phones already. So um, SMS is a great way to contact somebody. I, obviously, there is a con in the fact that uh, you may not uh, be able to receive uh, messages if you are uh, stuck in a basement or um, you know just anywhere out of signal. Uh, and secondly, uh, it costs money. Like to the site that's making this work worthwhile, of course, sending an SMS is going to cost something. Not much, but something. So there's that to factor in, and perhaps that's why people have been put off by it so far because it is kind of it's a, it's an upfront cost every time somebody wants to log in. I mean, you are able to do the kind of remember me for 30 days, that kind of cookie checkbox thing that you've probably seen on, on, uh, on two-factor auth, auth site. Um, but all the same, it's going to cost. So then there's the soft token. Um, and this, uh, I think, is, the kinda, is one of the interesting parts of it, because um, this is the case in which you maybe have used um, a uh, Google Authenticator app, uh, or, or the Authy app, if you've seen that at all. Uh, and this allows you to generate a code on a device and use that as the login code. And so in this case, the uh, user registration flow uh, changes again. Uh, so when you sign up with that username and password, the site needs to uh, generate uh, a secret, um, something long and strong, uh, lots of random digits, uh, and share that secret with the user somehow. That's the awkward part of it being a long secret, is that you have to share it uh, with the user somehow. And then you can verify at that point that it's been shared correctly, but otherwise the user's logged in. And then in the flow, uh, you visit the login page, enter username and password, and the system verifies that, and the user opens up that, that auth app, um, finds the 
a verification for the application they're trying to log into, enters it to the site. The system verifies that against how they create that code, uh, and uh, the user logged in. So, those secrets and those codes uh, I wanted to talk about quickly. Uh, so the way we make these six or, or more digit codes uh, that a, an independent device can calculate using just a secret as well as the application uh, is by the one-time one passwords is what they're called. Uh, in this case, HOTP or TOTP. Um, HOTP is the HMAC-based one-time password and TOTP being a time-based one-time password. Uh, and this is what that is. Um, this is kind of the mathematical definition of HOTP. Uh, which is not necessarily, uh, it's not, it's not um, necessary to understand, but I'm just going to go through it very quickly. Um, we take a, uh, the secret key and a counter. Uh, we make an HMAC signature with the key and the counter, normally using the SHA-1 hash. Uh, we use a specific truncation method, which picks out four bytes from the middle of that signature. Uh, and then um, over here, uh, we use uh, a bit mask to turn this into a positive integer in the case of signed ints. Uh, and then to get the actual value, uh, we just mod that HTTP uh, with um, 10 to the power how many characters you want. So 10 to the power 6 in this case, in normal case. Fairly straightforward. Uh, but what about it in code? Um, this is kind of the generate uh, OTP function from a, from a popular OTP library in Ruby. Uh, and it's fairly straightforward, which is quite cool. Um, or this bit is anyway. Like we take uh, OpenSSL and make an HMAC digest uh, using um, uh, using the di where did that digest come from. Anyway, uh, the byte secret has been saved earlier, and that is the secret turned into bytes. And then uh, the input is the counter in this case uh, turned into bytes. Uh, with that HMAC, we then uh, do the truncation, uh, and this is using a, a, an offset uh, that does fancy stuff. This is worth looking into later. Uh, I'm not going to go through and explain that right now. And then finally, um, uh, so that's the uh, you know mod um, the number of digits you want and uh, pad it out with zeros if you want to always have six digits. Uh, that is available, as I said, that's the ROTP library. Go check that out on GitHub. It's very readable. It's wonderful um, and shows you how this all works. Uh, and then TOTP, uh, the time-based one, is exactly the same algorithm, uh, but instead of a uh, an incrementing counter, uh, you use the time now, or the time in seconds since the epoch, uh, broken up into uh, periods of your choice. Normally, again, it's 30 seconds, uh, and you break it up into 30 second periods, and uh, you can work out the, the time at that, sorry, the, the code based on the time at that point. Uh, and so actually, I just wanted to show you how the library works as well. without dropping the microphone. All right, cool. Uh, all right, I'm going to go very quickly then, because I have five minutes apparently. Um, we're going to require our OTP just quickly. Uh, and what you can see is um, you can create an HOTP uh, using our OTP's HOTP module. Um, and you, you instantiate that with a secret uh, hello good secret, or bad secret in this case. Uh, and then you can go ahead and verify uh, that code. Uh, and the counter was, oh, sorry, we're going to generate or HTTP at zero. So at the first counter, it's that. At the second counter, it's that. And then you can kind of verify uh, the counter and uh, the code. No, you can't. What? Got it the wrong way around. Verify the code with the counter, and at the bottom we have true behind my head there, apparently. Uh, and similarly, uh, we can do the same with, sorry, I'm just going to move that screen higher for you. Oh, OK. Uh, we can do the same with TOTP, uh, which is the ROTP, TOTP, uh, dot new. And again, we send in the secret. And this way, we can just, um, if you can see that behind me, uh, you can see that just, uh, you can generate OTP. Uh, you can't. So at takes a time, time dot. Right, so that's the code right now. And similarly, you kind of verify uh, 
937254. And that's false because we've ticked over to the next period. But what you can do uh, with time is to uh, verify it with a drift. Uh, and we can give it a drift of, say, um, uh, 30 seconds. No, we can't. We put the drift in here. Uh, and now it's true again, because we've given it a drift to allow for that. So what this means, actually, is for most people, if you want to verify with a drift like this, to give a bit of a window for people to enter their codes. And it means that if you are using one of those applications, uh, then and it ticks down to the bottom of that period, uh, then you actually have a bit longer before you have to press enter. You don't have to rush the keyboard at that point. <laughs> and so that's a quick demo. Um, and, then I want to and then I want to... Hello. I'll stay here. Uh, and then I want to talk about sharing those secrets, because that's the uh, harder part, I think. Um, so normally, uh, this turns out in uh, authenticator-based things using QR codes. Uh, and so what you do is you generate a URL that looks a bit like this, with a type, that's HOTP or TOTP, uh, a label to tell the user what you're authenticating with, uh, and then the parameters, including uh, the type and an identifier for the application again, and the secret. And so uh, anauth uh, might look a bit like this. Uh, as you see, you've got TOTP in there. Uh, it's my example application for my email there. And it hands in a secret and, a, and an issuer, again, to show who made the app. Uh, and then uh, you get a QR code out. And this is my favorite Tumblr of all time, uh, because people don't like scanning QR codes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's cool, whatever. I think it, this might be the only good reason for a QR code in the world, uh, is to keep people safe. Um, but there are pros and cons to this. Uh, not everybody has a smartphone for a start, so uh, having a device that is able to um, read these things uh, and generate those tokens are not uh, particularly are not always possible. Um, pros are that it works offline, of course. Uh, you can generate this wherever you are, wherever you want to, as long as you have that secret. Um, but the con uh, kind of revol uh, the biggest con kind of revolves around that existence of the QR code, and if anybody else can. Uh, steal that QR code off of you whilst you're uh, doing it yourself, um, then they also own your secret, uh, and that's terrible. And, and finally, like you have to store those secrets yourself, um, and uh, you have to store those plainly, uh, or encrypted, but not hashed. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can't work out whether the codes are correct. So can it be better? Uh, these are the kind of two common things right now. Uh, and I think it can, uh, uh, for two reasons. Uh, you might have heard this kind of thing. Friends, friends write their own authentication frameworks. This is why we have things like Devise uh, and other authentication frameworks in Rails, um, because somebody's done all the hard work to uh, work this out for you. And I think that's probably the same, that you shouldn't write your own two-factor authentication framework. Uh, it's, it's hard to do. It's hard to keep safe. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about, so Authy is a company that Twilio purchased earlier this year uh, who do two-factor authentication as a service. Um, so. If I just take you through quickly the registration flow for this, um, when you sign up with Authy, you sign up with a username and password. Oh, sorry. If you sign up uh, in an account on a site that uses Authy, you need to provide a username, password, and a phone number. Um, the system registers the user with Authy using that phone number, and that phone number becomes that anchor, the thing that the user can use to prove who they are to Authy, and then the user's logged in. Uh, and then instead of uh, creating your own code using secrets and saving it for yourself, um, you just send off an API request to Authy, uh, which will prompt the user um, sending via either an SMS or Authy has an application uh, that will generate the codes for you. Um, but crucially, uh, in that registration flow, uh, if a user signs up and has the Authy application, uh, the, application uh, the app that signed them up will just appear on the application in Authy, uh, and that's like securely transmitted over to the app. Uh, no having to share QR codes, no having to create QR codes, which is nice. Uh, it's just there. Um, and then there's kind of the future. Uh, these kind of six-digit numbers are probably the bane of most people's existence who have uh, two-factor auth set up, and it's probably a good reason why people don't set two-factor auth up on their accounts, because it's a pain to go reach for your phone, find the six-digit code that you need to enter, and enter it into a thing. Nobody likes doing that. Um, and so uh, the future of a kind of two-factor authentication retains the fact that you own the device, um, but uses the power of push notifications to make everything just work nicer. Um, and I'm going to do, I, I think I'm running low on time, so I'm just going to show you a quick video of how that works. Um, this is using a fictional bank uh, that we created at Twilio uh, called Owl Bank. It does not exist, but when you log in, uh, it pops up a thing saying, I'm waiting for a code, uh, and then you get a push notification on your, uh, on your device. 
uh, you can log into that. Uh, and what it's going to do is actually show you a bunch of details that the application sends through via that push notification. And then you accept that, and it lets you log in. Um, importantly, uh, throughout this process, you're also able to enter um, the uh, token just generated by the application. Or down uh, here is a kind of set. I don't have a smartphone, and I can't do this. Send me a promo code. Uh, send me an SMS code. So. Um, the pros of this kind of thing is very much that you don't have to put those six-digit codes in anymore, which is wonderful. Lovely. You don't have to put those six-digit codes in anymore, which is wonderful. Um, the cons very much still rely on uh, on internet access and um, uh, having a smartphone. Uh, so, kind of in summary, uh, users are pretty bad with passwords. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Never use it. Um, other websites are bad with passwords. Uh, even websites you're supposed to trust with things. I don't know. They're bad. Um, you can never trust them. So two-factor authentication can be push token or SMS. And I actually recommend uh, if you implement two-factor authentication that it should, in fact, uh, use all three of those, kind of degrading as required, uh, kind of like in that example. Uh, and finally, two-factor authentication is not for you with your uh, crazy long passwords all stuffed up into one password. It's not for you, uh, you know, with your own. Two you have two-factor set up. It's fine. It's for those users who do use bad passwords, who do use uh, sites that do not look after passwords. Uh, and so, I want to see two-factor uh, on everything. Uh, and to keep this guy, <laughs> I don't know where he got that padlock from. Presumably, it's from the URL bar. I, I, don't, I don't know. But he's unlocked it, so he's in charge. Um, do not let this guy uh, attack your users. Um, thank you very much.